Hello there, and welcome to another episode of Syracuse Sports. My name is Brent Dax. Syracuse Sports is presented by Kraus Health, the official healthcare provider of SU Athletics. Uh, love that you're here. Are you watching on YouTube? Fantastic. Are you listening on Spotify? Fabulous. Are you listening on Apple or Amazon or wherever you found this podcast? We thank you for taking this journey with us. Please subscribe, please follow, please leave a review, and please leave us a voicemail. We had some great voicemails come in at halftime of the Syracuse-North Carolina game, after the Syracuse-North Carolina game, and just during the week. Our voicemail line is 315-552-1964. And speaking of which, we do a post-game show. That's where those halftime calls came from, because you guys know that Emily Liker and I do a Syracuse football post-game show, and we do it live after every Syracuse football game. You can find it live on Syracuse Orange Sports on YouTube. You can find it live on Syracuse Orange Football on Facebook and on my Twitter feed, which is on your screen there if you're watching on YouTube, at Brent Axe Media as well. You'll still find it on podcast form and all those places as well. After the post-game show, Saturday, Orange take on Florida State. It's a noon kickoff, so our post-game show will come later that afternoon, probably about 5 o'clock or so after all post-game festivities are taken care of. So you are welcome to join us there. Your comments highlighted, all kinds of good stuff, and take advantage of that voicemail line. Dino Babers is usually pretty reserved in his press conferences. Now, Dino has a fun way of addressing things when he doesn't want to tell you something. He'll make a movie reference or he'll smile and chuckle and say one of his favorite things to say sometimes at press conferences, frankly. I'm not going to tell you that. He's a football coach, right? Football coaches only tell you so much. But Dino Babers certainly had something on his mind this week. And what I found intriguing about this Wading into the world of name, image, and likeness and the transfer portal, an ever-present topic, of course, in the world of college football and college sports, was it was unprompted. So I want to go through a couple of things that Dino said here. At his uh, weekly press conference, happens on Monday afternoons, or Monday mornings, actually, at 11 o'clock. I asked Dino about the depth on his football team. Here's what he said. You know, halfway through the season, how would you characterize the depth on this team? Not only the injuries that we know about, but the owies and, and the things behind the scenes you're dealing with. Brent, it's the same old thing. Depth is gone. You know, our depth is in the transfer portal. You know how many guys we lost. You know what schools they play at. There's schools like us, we're not going to have a lot of depth because it gets bought away. It gets bought away, which was – an intriguing thing for Dino to say, and depth, transfer portal, depth, NIL, they're all related. But I was talking about the injuries that he has on his football team. And you could tell that name, image, and likeness and just the modern way of college football. I don't know if he woke up on the wrong side of the bed that day, but he was as blunt and direct. And you could tell he was irritated about the subject as well and honest about the situation our depth gets bought away you know deuce chestnut goes to lsu jihad carter goes to ohio state other players that left via the transfer portal it came up again in the press conference when dino was asked this time not by me somebody else about what he learned about the florida state game a year ago a game in which syracuse got blown out here's what he said last year's game showed me exactly what name image and likeness can do because the year before that we went down there and we were they kicked for a field goal in the very last play to beat us. And then the year, two years before that, we went down there. We were kicking for a field goal to tie them when it got blocked. So it showed me how well, when you do it right, how quickly you can change a football team. Clearly on Dino's mind. Again, a question not necessarily about NIL, but he brought it up again. So when it was my turn again in the rotation of the reporters asking questions of Dino on Monday, I had to ask directly this time about name, image, and likeness. Here's what he said. Coach, going back to what you said about how depth gets bought away and then what you just said there about Florida State doing it right with NIL, do you feel Syracuse is, is making progress in that department? Are you getting better at in, in the NIL, NIL department where you can be in that conversation with these schools? I'm not going to talk about any of that stuff. Well, he kind of already had, right? Bringing up twice in the press conferences from the clips that you heard right there. 
here's the thing. Dino's not wrong about what he noted and how Syracuse has challenges in the name, image, and likeness department. But I think he fumbled at the goal line there. If you're already bringing it up at a press conference and you're already expressing the frustrations that you have with name, image, and likeness, your players getting bought away, as he said, I think he had to present some solutions there. And there are some, even if it's just as simple as appealing to alums, either Syracuse University alums or players that maybe have some money in their pocket now at the National Football League to give to the school, give to NIL, make it easier for players to have access to this. Syracuse has a new, as they put it, a preferred name, image, and likeness kind of in-house thing. It's called Orange United. What an opportunity there for Dino Babers to call that out. Now it's new, so maybe it wasn't front and present. But to say, I'm not going to talk about that stuff after you had talked about that stuff, I thought was strange. And I think Dino would have a lot of people on his side here. I thought the reaction on social media, and man, did this blow up on social media, was something along the lines of if he had to kind of condense it down, that Dino's not wrong, but that's not the way to handle it. Had Dino got over the goal line, made the appeal, I think people would have understood it's part of the gig these days. Mark Stoops at Kentucky on his radio show this week flat out said, you know, fans have a right to complain, but we need more name, image, and likeness money. Now, he was asked about competing with Georgia, which, <laughs> I mean, that's a very tall task for anybody, even Kentucky, Syracuse, no matter who we're talking about here, but made the direct appeal. Mike Gundy at Oklahoma State this week flat out said, why build facilities just put the money into NIL. He said, I don't agree with that, but that's the way of the world today. Syracuse, obviously, just a couple of weeks ago, very proud of the fact the Lallies donating upwards of $25 million to build the new football complex and the new football facilities, which are needed, by the way. But I think it's an interesting discussion these days about where you pool your money, where you get people to donate, either name, image, and likeness, which has a much shorter shelf life because these players are only here for a couple of years, or facilities, which, you know, will last much longer in that case. But in the case of the facility, Syracuse only caught up with some of the schools in the ACC and certainly have not exceeded some of the schools in the ACC. And that's been in the shadow of one of the best basketball facilities in the country in the Mellow Center. So Dino Babers, as blunt, as opinionated, and as upfront as we've seen him, frankly, let's see more of that. Let's see him use that opportunity to reach out. Here we are in year eight, and he rarely does that. He has held himself back on certain things. He has a way of expressing himself. I don't know if he has a fear of getting in trouble from his superiors, from the ACC, whatever the case may be. Dino certainly has a way of getting his point across, but man, just straight up bold. We don't have the depth, schools like us, but fell just short in this case, fumbled at the goal line. Make the appeal, make the ask. Maybe by Dino just bringing it up and the social media reaction, a lot of former players I saw chiming in on social media, Josh Black and Mike L. Jones included, maybe this will stir the hornet's nest up a little bit and the point that he was trying to make will be made one way or the other. Well, we know this, Syracuse has six games to go and six down. We're at the midway point of the 2023 season. I brought in my colleagues, Chris Carlson and Emily Liker, who also cover football for Syracuse.com and the Post Standard, to uh, have a little fun. Our midseason awards you can find on Syracuse.com and the Post Standard, and it's all the stuff you would expect, offensive MVP, defensive MVP, and things of that nature. But we had some different categories that we got to. Hope you enjoy it. To steal a phrase from Scott Hansen, we've gone triple box here. Emily Liker, Chris Carlson, Brent Dax, Syracuse.com. Now, if you go to Syracuse.com or your post-standard newspaper, you will find our midseason awards. Offensive MVP, defensive MVP, ACC prediction, things of that nature. As kind of a compliment to that, we wanted to do, I guess, guys, what I'll call the other midseason awards here, the 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 offbeat midseason awards, and look at some things that didn't quite make our official midseason awards. So I'm gonna dive right in, and Emily, I will start with you. What was the most interesting moment of the first half of the Syracuse football season to you? So I I narrowed down two, and both are pretty recent. Um the first being that opening hit 
on Garrett Schrader in the Clemson game, just because mm-hmm. as much as they tried to tell us post game that that didn't affect him, I do think it affected him that game. And I think it's, it's really interesting to consider how that game would have gone if they had kept the ball in their possession there, if they had gotten on the board first, if they hadn't given up seven points off that turnover. Like, I think if that hit doesn't happen, we're looking at like a much more competitive game and maybe a Syracuse win. Now, I don't know if that would have given them any better momentum going into the UNC game when they got wallop, but it feels like there could have been more ripple effects from that hit on Garrett than Syracuse would like to acknowledge. And then the other thing that I found interesting that barely sneaks in first half of the season is Dino's uh, depth comment on Monday and depth related to NIL. I think one, it's interesting just from the substance. And two, I think it's interesting because we don't often hear Dino say things like that. And so it just kind of felt like, okay, is this like some kind of changing mentality inside Dino of how he's going to talk about these things? Did something trigger him into talking about that situation um I don't know I was I was very fascinated by his decision to speak out on that at that time Chris how about you uh I'm gonna go uh same game as Emily's first one but the the 57 yard field goal attempt (laughs) and, and the three deep shots that led up to it um you know And then the answer, right? That, well, he can make it. It's like, okay, but, you know, uh, that doesn't necessarily tell me anything about whether there was strategy in taking it, taking that chance at that point. Um, You know, and and the fact that that Jason Beck called the three deep passes seemingly didn't try to make it any closer, right? There was no communication. Hey, you know, I want to kick a field goal on fourth down. Can we dial up something that gets four or five yards here? Or maybe there was, right? Maybe it wasn't there and, and, and Trader just threw it deep, or maybe Garrett just decided to throw it deep. But uh, it was the opposite of complimentary football. Mine was uh, the Colgate game and how fascinating that was. No, I'm kidding. Uh, it is uh, what Emily brought up, that presser on Monday. I mean, for Dino twice, by the way, to bring that up when he wasn't even asked about it. Now, my depth question, I think you can relate to NIL and you can connect the dots. There are players are getting bought off. But the question I asked was about just the depth of this team. I said, you know, how are you affected by the injuries that we know about the players that are out for the year, which is at this point four, and maybe some behind the scenes things and owies as Dino likes to say, and he directly related that and forcefully related that to NIL and our players are getting bought away. It comes up again when he's asked the lessons learned from the Florida State game last year. Again, they lost 38-3 and how Florida State does it right with NIL and the transfer portal. And then I asked him directly, you know, what do you think about what Syracuse is doing about it? And he said, I don't want to talk about that. (laughs) Well, wait a minute. You just did twice, right? So I feel like Emily said, what's bubbling behind the scenes? Why is that sticking in his craw? I mean, it's obviously a topic that is around college football all the time. Now, Mark Stoops had some interesting comments about that on his radio show. Mike Gundy saying this week at Oklahoma State, don't even bother with facilities. They just put all the money in NIL. So uh, more to come on that for sure. And Dino was as uh, blunt as I have seen him, particularly to a question he was not directly asked about. So let's stay in the interesting department. And the most interesting thing that you have heard from a player And I'm going to lead this one off, okay? I talked to wide receiver Daryl Gill Jr. He had just got on the depth chart, worked his way up. As we know, there's been some injuries on this team. And we had a great conversation about life in Texas, and he was a track star there and just kind of really getting into his life. So I asked Daryl what it's like to have four siblings. And he corrected me, and he said, oh, no, sir. I have nine siblings, <laughs> nine. And it was just interesting to hear about life in that household. He's the second youngest and the lessons he learned from everybody above him. And it was, uh, it was an eye opening moment to, you know, uh, be corrected on that. We went from four to nine, uh, in that case. And that, that was just, that was fascinating to me. Chris, how about you? Uh, I wish I had something as fun. Uh, <laughs> that's a great anecdote. Um, I think it's like a combination of like Garrett Trader, you know, 
he's pretty blunt when he assesses like what the game plan is and, and what works. Uh, you know, and in Clemson, he's like, yeah, we thought we could run past him and we couldn't. Uh, and in North Carolina, he's like, yeah, we thought we could run the ball and we couldn't. Um, and then the comment after that game that they didn't felt like they didn't have an identity. Um, and then we asked him this week, you know, all right, what do you hang your hat on? And he's like, well, we get our best players, the ball in, in good spots. And I don't know. That's not an identity, you know, and then that's, that's what I worry about moving forward the second half of the season. Like what is this offense going to be good at? Mine. I see. I suggested this question and then I was like, do I even have something that is like really <laughs> that interesting to put in here? I think I would go just with like kind of generally, like anytime we talk to Yamari Hatcher or Yamari Hatcher gets brought up by someone else, it feels like, we learned something very odd and interesting. Like this week it was like Dino drops this line in his press conference where he's like, yeah, Yumari really got some truth thrown at him last week after the Clemson game, when he posted a goose egg, he did not have a single catch or any, anything in that game. Um, Earlier in the season, obviously it was like the whole, he changed his nightlife and stuff like that. And I think just, just getting to talk with him and how he's grown up has been like a really interesting conversation throughout the year. Um, And if we're just talking most quotable, I think it's Donovan Brown. Donovan Brown has had some funny, funny, just quotable moments, particularly after that game when he had the 86 yard touchdown. Very confident young man does not sound like a freshman at all. And uh, I think more to come in that department uh, from him for sure. Okay. What was I thinking? This could be a prediction officially made on Syracuse.com. A comment made just between the three of us, just something that, you completely misfired on here uh, in the first half. Emily, I'll start with you. I think this is something we we all kind of misfired on. Um, and again, like not to keep bringing up the Clemson game, but like the fact that like Garrett Schrader could have saved them in this Clemson game. Like that was a storyline we here at Syracuse.com really played up heading into that week. And it ended up being like Garrett's worst game of the season. And again, there's like so much with like the fact that he took that really hard hit And like, just perception wise, I know all of us were thinking that he was affected by it, but then it's like, okay, he said he wasn't. Um, But yeah, I, it's, it's tough. I don't think he has the spot in the kind of pantheon of Syracuse quarterbacks that we thought maybe he could, if he won that game or even played well in, in the next two games after it, obviously we're waiting on FSU this weekend, I guess, if he does something super spectacular against them maybe maybe there's still a spot for him but it feels unlikely at this point chris how about you yeah i drew the short straw uh writing that story uh so uh todd on twitter who uh was adamant that i was ridiculous for putting schrader in the pantheon of greats or close uh todd wins this round i suppose <laughs> uh, you know it it stinks I mean, but I, you know, I had a Rodney Gadsden as the offensive MVP of, of the season. And, uh, you know, through no fault of his own, obviously, and, and no fault of logic, but like that's a prediction that didn't work out. Um, and obviously has had a, you know, a, a larger impact on the season than I think we thought maybe. Uh, you know, they looked good for a while um, and with the, the young wide receivers, but they really missed like a big physical presence at this point. I took a flyer on this one. And I was almost right. And my, uh, what was I thinking was Syracuse beats Clemson. I just flat out predicted it in our preseason superlatives. They kind of almost did. It was 14 7 approaching halftime. Chris, you mentioned the 57 yard field goal. They had nine penalties in that game. They had a bunch of drops. Uh, the defense dropped a couple of uh, Pick sixes. big plays. You know, what was that, Chris? Pick sixes. I mean, pick sixes. Not- exactly. Yeah. These were game changing pick six plays that they dropped. So uh, they almost proved me right in that. It wasn't like the North Carolina game where they were in no way, shape, or form in that football game. But I guess I should know better. And, you know, having, I mean, you got to pick weird stuff to happen in the season. Maybe we'll do that in our second half predictions. But that's about as big of a misfire as I had. Now on the other end of this, great show on Netflix, by the way. Nailed it. Okay, Emily, what did you get right? What did you just boom, hammer to the nail, got it right in the first half of the season? 
I mean, I predicted that Marlo Wax is going to be this team's defensive MVP. And I mean, he clearly is. He's on pace for his probably his best season of his career. I think he has 45 tackles right now. He finished last season with 91 to lead the team. Uh, Justin Barron's right on his tail, though. Obviously, uh, Justin is now a little crippled with a um, club on his hand. But, you know, Marlo, I think, has just stepped up so much, both like kind of in the leadership portion of this and then also on the field and outside of that one kind of dicey moment when he maybe pushed Cade Klubnik and and gave up a first down on a penalty there like he has mostly been pretty solid and and level-headed I think for this defense and and really stepped up into Michael Jones's role both as kind of like the heart of the defense and this team's middle linebacker uh very well Chris I'll jump in and say uh it was biggest uh, newcomer, most important newcomer. And I picked Brady Denneberg and Jack Stonehouse. And these guys have been solid. Yeah, Jack Stonehouse is averaging 46 yards a punt. It's 14th in the country. He's actually third in the ACC. He's got a couple of guys in the ACC ahead of him, including Florida State's punter, who we'll see this week, who's fifth in the country. He's been fine. He had a couple of bloops, a couple of kicks off the side of his foot to be expected for a young guy stepping in there. And Denneberg is six of eight from field goals, but I'm going to give him the 57 yarder that Dino shoved him out there to kick, which he shouldn't have. So he's seven of eight looks like a future star. I think Dino might be onto something when he says like this kid could set the school record or could be great, but the kicking game, which let's, you know, Andre Schmidt was terrific, but missed more than you would think last year. And the punting game was so inconsistent last year. These guys have come in and, and it's been smooth sailing. Chris, what do you think? Uh, haven't been proven right yet, but I like my season prediction and the rationale. Uh, I had a seven and five finish, which I think looks pretty plausible at this point, but I like them to finish strong. That was my bold prediction. The first strong, the second strong finish in the Dino Babers era. I liked it because they were playing teams that had the same depth issues that they have at the end of the year. Uh, Wake Forest, uh, Boston College, you know, d- teams that are sort of in the same NIL ballpark as Syracuse. And I think, right, Syracuse is having depth issues. If they do get to that 7-5 and five mark, it's going to be because of the soft finish uh, to the season. Chris, I'll stick with you for a second here as we go to the second half prediction you feel strongest about. Is it that, that they're going to end up at that 7-5 and five record that you predicted, or is there something else you feel strongest about? So we picked... Uh, most important newcomer. And I think Emily picked this, and I think she was right at the start of the season when she picked, I think, Jason Beck uh, as the most important newcomer. I could be wrong. Um, mm. But, like, to me, he is. Like, he does not have many pieces to work with on offense. You, you lost uh, your number one, the guy I consider your number two target, and probably the guy that Garrett would have been Garrett Trader's top security blanket heading into the year. You're playing without those guys right now. Now, Isaiah Jones probably comes back. We don't know about Trevor Pena. But, like, you have a first-time offensive coordinator who has to, like, figure out what they're doing on offense for the second half of the season. And that's, like, a, it's a really hard job for an experienced offensive coordinator. It's a really, really hard job for a first-time guy. Emily, what's the second-half prediction you feel strongest about? Um, Kind of going with – Chris and what he had just said about nailing the season prediction. I also had seven and five. And part of my, my season prediction was that they're going to drop one to someone who's unexpected here at the end of this slate um, one or two. And I think that's definitely possible. I mean, like Georgia tech, I think is a lot better than we thought they were going to be um, during the season. I think that's a possible game that SU drops everything I've heard about traveling to Virginia tech is that it's a lot harder than it um, appears to be on paper, even when Virginia tech isn't very good, like it is this season. So I think that's another one they could drop. I still think this is a team that that finishes seven and five or maybe six and six. Um, But I, I feel pretty confident about that, that there's going to be another one or two games that they drop that people thought they should have won. That's kind of a clean sweep for the three of us because that's what I feel strongest about. I've, I've talked to some people that have talked to people high above, if you will, and there's like an expectation that they're going to win. And, and I'm doing the math in my head to win out and, and go nine and three. 
that's not going to happen just by, I think, the injuries on this team, what you brought up, Emily, there's going to be a WTF game where just you, what, what happened there kind of thing. And then I just think Syracuse, I hope Chris's prediction comes true and we see a stronger finish and this team is interesting, but they just don't have that kind of track record. And given the rate of injuries we've seen and the challenges to the depth that are there that Dino admitted already, I feel good about seven and five. I feel good about this team being able to win a few games down the stretch that they're supposed to win, even with all the road games or neutral site games that are there. And I would kind of put that uh, as a tie of, you know, if I could create a category, things I'm most intrigued about. Second half storylines that intrigue you is next, but I don't want to take the answer from anybody there, but the, there's just so many road games and neutral site games on the back end of the schedule here. But I think they will navigate that. They'll be seven and five. They'll go to a bowl game. So on that note, we all think they're going to be about seven and five, which means they'll go nine and three because we just jinxed it, right? <laughs> but that leads me to the next question. And Chris, I'll start with you. The second half storyline that intrigues you the most. Oh, well, I think I just blew it on the, the last answer, um, right? But, it, but it, it's just how they coax – offense out of a team that like doesn't have an offensive line um doesn't have reliable wide receivers and you know a, a quarterback who, who who is very game at, at running um but doesn't seem like a guy who's gonna stay in the pocket and, and sling the ball around um i don't know you know we'll, we'll, we'll see how smart they are emily how about you i think i don't know i i waffled on this a little bit i think like a gar- a guaranteed intriguing storyline is going to be whatever happens at Virginia Tech because if they can come out and crush Virginia Tech then i think they're in pretty strong position to get where they need to be by the end of the season if they lose to Virginia Tech i do worry about a slide continuing and things going really downhill for them so i think that game is is going to be very intriguing Another storyline I'm intrigued by, but is kind of just more a possibility right now, is what happens to Dino Babers if this team finishes six and six? Because this is this is something we've talked about all of us at different points, but it just feels like if they if they can only hit that point five hundred mark. Like, what do you do with a guy who only has one year left on his contract? Do you give him a two-year extension, give him a little bit more time, give him a one-year extension, whatever it may be? Or do you just decide that, like, this is a time to cut ties? I I don't know. I think seven and five, eight and four, they likely extend him for a couple years. Six and six, I don't know what they do. I think if he finishes below six and six, it's going to look bad for him, for them if they don't let go of him. But six and six is kind of this weird point where it's like what will Syracuse do it is it's such a fascinating record because like Mm -hmm. there would be no optimism like none like they played a soft schedule they only went 500 but it would be you know the first time the team's gone to -to back-to-back bowl games in 10 years so like you know not bad historically over the past two years does Syracuse fire a football coach for you know performing not bad by its recent standards at least emily i think you nailed it and it's mine too and it's not just how they handle the situation to me it's when all right so as the ticker goes up and let's say you get the six wins do you just announce the extension right then and there ticker gets up to seven wins do you just put all doubt aside that you're going to have a coach in a lame duck season next year without a contract and say that Dino Babers has been extended and by uh, Syracuse uh, methods, they will not tell us for how long, but they will say a lot of things about security and, and we know who the coach is and we're an ascending brand with a coach who has built us back to the promised land. Certainly eight wins. If that comes in the regular season or at a bowl win. So when do you announce the extension if you announce the extension six and six to me, that's tough because Chris said it. What's the standard here? It's pretty much whether you agree or disagree with it, get to a bowl game. Dino gets into a bowl game. Can you fire him? Can you move on from him? Can you let him retire? I mean, I think you can just speaking generally, I'm not saying that's what they should do, but Mike Elko at Duke, Deion Sanders at Colorado, Jeff Brom at Louisville, it can work. 
right? And Chris, you said it, like, what's the motivation? What's the energy there? Like, I don't think you're going to put a jolt into the fan base. But you also, I believe, Chris, I know you disagree with me on this, so jump in here. I don't think you can have a coach without a contract next year. So I think John Wildhex in kind of a rock between a hard place there. I think they probably have to choose, you know, and, 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 you know, you can extend at Syracuse, you can extend without putting a lot in the buyout and we can't get the contract. Right. So you can, you can extend, but not really extend a lot. Um, but I don't know, like, like in the world of the transfer portal where you can flip a roster in a year and players can leave in a year, like, it doesn't matter. Like, like everybody is just year to year in, in this new world and nobody's planning to be anywhere for like four years. Like, I don't know. I don't know. I know common, I know tradition says you can't have a coach going into his final year, but I don't know if that, I don't know if that holds up anymore. I think, I think you can, but the more logical thing would be to extend at be, without much cost right? Without much obligation on your end, but you can tell people that you have your coach locked down for a lengthy period of time. Emily, if anything, this is going to be truth serum sticking on six and six, right? Because you believe, I believe, Chris, I, I think you believe this too. And I think fans have the perception that it, let's say they finish six and six. I'm not including a bowl game at this point, six and six regular season. People think like they'll be satisfied with that. They'll be good enough. This will be the ultimate test to say, well, what does Syracuse think about that? What does John Wildhack think about that? What does, you know, whoever on the list you want here, decision makers, people that affect this, think about six and six? That's going to tell us what they think about six and six, depending on what they do with the coach. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we've talked a lot in the past week about Wildhack's comments about this is a brand on a rise. And how do you have a brand on the rise? that has a six and six record. Like it just, it just doesn't check out to me. Um, to go back to your, your timing comment, Brent, for a second, backtrack a couple steps here. I do think it's interesting. So we said if they make it to the six win threshold. I don't think they would just announce a, an extension for Dino after six games that they win. Now, seven games, we get into interesting territory, right? Let's assume that they lose Florida State this week. I think that's a pretty safe assumption. It would take something wild happening for them to beat Florida State. That seventh, the earliest they could get that seventh win would be the pit game, which we know is something they have hung their hat on despite all of the fans not really liking it. Like Wild Hack is like, oh, Herm cut a, a good deal. Like this is a, something they're trying to make a big deal out of. So I think if they reached seven wins at that point, especially if it was some like blowout win over Pittsburgh on this national stage in, in New York City, then I could maybe see them, if they were going to do it, making a decision about Dino then and announcing it um, just because of the circumstances surrounding that game and the fact that they moved it and it's on this, it's this big event and this historical thing. Um, so that's interesting to consider. Cause like, that's the only situation where I think it would make sense to announce like mid season or where they could see some benefit to announcing mid season. Otherwise, I think you just want to let it play out the whole year and see, see where they are after that wake forest game to end the regular season. And that is, I mean, right. That is, um, that's sort of John Wildhack's MO, right? Like he is a, let the season play out. Like we'll deal with this after the season, like type of at least publicly, right? Maybe they'll be having conversations behind the scenes, but like that that's sort of, sort of always been his, how he's handled any coaching question with us is we'll sit down after the season and talk about it. So I, I would expect that from them. And I'll, I'll hold to this as we end here, ladies and gentlemen, and that is no matter what, if it's on the line, he will not fire him. John Wildhack doesn't fire coaches. He gives them graceful exits, and they come up with uh, some other uh, way to phrase it. But uh, that is a – I'll probably file this under second-half prediction I feel strongest about. He's not going to fire Dino Babers. Doesn't mean they won't make a change, but he's not going to fire him. If that Part ways? Sense. Retire? Think of all the creative ways to say it, and that's where the category it will fall under, my friend. They're consciously uncoupling. Ooh, write that down. 
That's hire a her. good one. Someone, someone, someone hire, hire Emily. That's a, uh, that's a, that's an inner, I can't claim creating that phrase, but it's like an entertainment pop culture divorce type phrase. That's fantastic. Is that what, uh, uh, which Jonas brothers getting divorced right now? Is that the term that they Joe, use for that? Joe, Joe and Jones. Sophie. Joe and Sophie. <laughs> love, love is dead. If Joe and Sophie can't make it. Friends, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And thanks to Emily and Chris uh, for being a part of our midseason awards. Six down, six to go, guys. Thank you so much for checking out Syracuse Sports today, my friends. Remember to subscribe. Apple, YouTube, Amazon, Spotify, wherever you prefer to get your podcasts. And wherever you prefer to leave reviews, if you're an Apple subscriber in particular, please leave us a review. It helps us stand out in the podcast world. Plus, we want to hear what you think of the show, what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, what you want us to talk about, what you don't want us to talk about. So please leave us a review. Don't forget about the voicemail line, 315-552-1964. We've had a couple of great calls during halftime of recent Syracuse football games, hoping it would get better in the second half. It didn't get better in the second half. We'll see if it does against Florida State and going forward here into the second half of the season. But the voicemail line there for you. Find us on Twitter, Brent Axe Media, and you can email as well, B-A-X-E at Syracuse.com, all there on your screen on YouTube if you're watching us there. Thanks for checking us out. Please subscri subscribe, as we noted, and, and leave a review. And don't forget about our live post game show after the Orange take on Florida State. Emily Liker and I... We'll do it live on our YouTube page, which you can see on your screen there, at Syracuse Orange Sports. Find us on Facebook, Syracuse Orange Football on Syracuse.com, and my Twitter feed, at Brent Axe Media. Don't worry, it'll all be in podcast form as well after the game. But if you want to check us out live, have your comments highlighted, maybe hear some of your voicemails, join us about, I'd say, 5 o'clock or so after the Orange take on Florida State with a noon kickoff. Thanks for checking out Syracuse Sports, everybody. We'll talk to you next time.